our opening remarks tonight, we are really privileged to have here the Minister for Economic Development, Sir Joe Bosano. Please give him a warm welcome. Um, there's something very special about the relationship that we've got with the United States because I wouldn't be here today and possibly Gibraltar would not exist as an independent entity economically today if it hadn't been for the connection with the United States. And uh, the story, which uh, some of you may have heard and those who haven't heard will probably be surprised when you, when you hear it, starts in 1986 when I was the leader of the opposition and, and the leader of the local trade union movement, and I was approached by the U.S. Embassy uh, who, uh, with a message from London, which I sent through the consul in Tangier, that they would like to invite me to uh, go to the U.S. for one month as their guest. And uh, under what they had, which was called the International Visitor Program. And of course, I was rather surprised at the invitation, and the generous invitation that would pay all the expenses. I wouldn't have been able to go if I hadn't, because I hadn't had any to my name. So, um, so I said, well, why, should you, um, why should you want to invite me? And the, they were very open about it, which impressed me. They said, well, uh, you've got a reputation for being a very left-wing, uh, anti-establishment trade union leader, and in the circles that you move, you, you probably have uh, heard only bad things about the United States, and uh, we think you should judge us by uh, coming over and experiencing what we're like really, and then make up your own mind. I said, okay, uh, you know, I don't necessarily admit that I'm a rebel, uh, anti-establishment figure, obviously, I really was, but I didn't admit it. <laughs> I think I still am, really. And uh, and I said, well, why why should this, the the U.S. government, you know, I mean, Gibraltar is a dot in the map, <laughs> thirty thousand people. Why should the U.S. government want to persuade me? And the guy says, well, it's very simple. The CIA have uh, uh, advised the president that you're going to win the election in two years' time. And I said, well, that's very nice. The CIA, I wish they could vote. <laughs> so I went, and it was something that made a huge impact on me. You know, they they wanted to to uh, they said I could go wherever I want. They they even took me to uh, on a tour of the Pentagon and of the huge base in, in West Virginia, in spite of my left wing credentials. And uh, and you see the the. They said I, I could meet the, the trade unions, and I said, I don't think it's a good idea for you, for me to meet your trade unions. <laughs> I, they, you, might, they, you might find there are different trade unions after meeting me. And I said, look, I really want to meet your capitalists. This is the thing that, that you say I need to be convinced about. Well, convince me. I want to meet the top guys, and I, wanna, and I met people that seemed to be discharging electricity in the room, even before they spoke. And it was, it was obvious to me that there was something about the American economy and the entrepreneurship that is part of its culture that makes things happen at a speed which was not normal in a European context. And I thought, well, I need to bring this to Gibraltar. Because when I, had, uh, uh, when I was elected in 1988, the experience of 1996, uh, 1986 was crucial. And during that visit, uh, one of the uh, uh, organizations that I met was Ninex, who were responsible for the telecommunications in Wall Street. In 1988, the CIA was right, and I got elected, and I became the chief minister. Maybe it's the only time the CIA got it right, but they got it right this time. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a very difficult time in Gibraltar, a, a very difficult time for somebody like me with a trade union background. The, the Ministry of Defense was uh, retrenching. The resident battalion was being removed. 
the naval dockyard was on its last legs, we were facing unemployment and no alternatives. And we had a telephone system, which was a crossbar exchange, where we had people sitting in the city hall, in a municipal telephone company, well company, no, it was a municipal telephone department, and uh, when you wanted to make a telephone call, you had to call ahead and book it. And then they would call you back three hours later and say, we've now got the person you want to talk to in London, and then you plug you in and you could talk. Of course, before you got there, you had to have a telephone in your business, and that took six months. There was a waiting list of six months to get the telephone. So you can imagine transforming the economy <laughs> with that sort of infrastructure was a superhuman uh, activity, which w it was impossible. With that setup, nobody would have come to Revolta. We would have had no banking, no finance center, no gaming companies, nothing. Right? So um, I remembered Ninex. And I, we opened uh, international uh, offers for a joint venture with the government to come in and, and uh, take over our telephone system and convert it into something that was state of the art. And Ninex was very keen to get into Europe, and they were very keen to come into Gibraltar because it was the only place that they could get into Europe easily. And from here, as part of the European Union, they were able to access other parts of the European market. And they came in, we created a joint venture. That joint venture is now known as Jeep Telecom. Its original value was uh, uh, seven and a half million pounds. Uh, 50 million pounds, seven and a half million pounds each shareholder. The present value is a uh, hundred times that, 150 million. And at the time, uh, I used my negotiating skills from the trade union movement to negotiate with the uh, Americans, with Ninex, that the joint venture would be worth uh, 50 million, that they would put in seven and a half million cash. The nominal value of the company is still 15 million. And I would put in my um, antique exchange, which I valued at seven and a half million. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so we now had a company that owned an antique exchange and had seven and a half million cash. And I said, now, for the license to operate, I will charge you seven and a half million. <laughs> so I finished up. <laughs> so, you know, the taxpayer finished with seven and a half million and 50% share of a company that became the heart and soul of the new Gibraltar that was transformed. So, you know, without the CIA, uh, we might never have made it. <laughs> and today we have uh, uh, some uh, guests that are going to speak to you from uh, their experience of startups in Silicon Valley, and that is the new transformation, the transformation of the economy that we did in 1988 is the transformation of the degree that needs to be done in Gibraltar in the context of Brexit. And that is what we are committed to doing. That is a detailed post-Brexit national economic plan. I am the guy that writes the national economic plans every four years. And uh, I have uh, every reason to believe that I will deliver this one like I've delivered all the others. And the new input that we're getting into our economy from startups and from people who are coming here sharing their knowledge with you is what is required. We're entering a new world, a world which is very exciting compared to anything that's happened. All the previous advances in science and technology are going to pale into insignificance in the new world that we're entering. Unless we totally, you know, mess it up with uh, failing to deal with the challenge of climatic change. But if we can control that and we survive as a species, then the world after the transformation of the technology that we are playing around with, there are two fundamental things that will change the very concepts of economics, the very concepts of science, the very concept of how we live. And one is the artificial intelligence and particularly the capacity of quantum computing computers, which is just around the corner, and the possibility of breaking through on fusion energy, which will give us almost unlimited free energy. 
the concept of economic, which is based on scarcity, will have to find a new concept, a new foundation. So uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and share my experiences with you. And I hope you have a very fruitful uh, meeting and learn a lot from the speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'd like to introduce Vadim Balashov, who's at the back of the room. He's just going to come over. We'll give him a round of applause, too. <laughs> so hi, Vadim. Um, Vadim, you are Managing Director of Viaduct Ventures, and this is an impact investing and sector building initiative that connects foundations and private individuals with impact-driven entrepreneurs in Europe. But you're going to tell us throughout the evening a little bit more about what you do and what your background is. So let's start with your um, professional career. You were an EY partner, practice leader for telecom and technology. Correct. Look at that. So you saw growth it's in... Not a ch it's not by chance. <laughs> <laughs> So you saw growth in venture capital and you decided to join. But just talk us through that process and mm -hmm. your experiences in your first uh, This is the 21st part. century. Yes. Right? I stayed at 25 years in one place, which people don't do that anymore. So it was time for me to stop. So effectively what happened is I wrapped up my, 20, my first 25-year career with uh, public accounting and financial financial consulting. And now I am well into the uh, sixth year of my second 25-year career. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds funny, it sounds like a joke. It is actually not. You have probably all seen and read the, uh, uh, the serious publications as well as the fun publications by people like Gary Vaynerchuk who says, if you're 45, if you're 50, it's not time to ramp down your life and figure out your retirement. It's time to actually start again, but with all the experience and all the, um, all the knowledge that you have collected over the first 25 years. Also, your kids are probably grown up and out of the house, uh, so you can dedicate yourself to your new career in an unlimited way, unrestrained way, like you did when you first came out of the university at age 21. So this is exactly what I'm doing. I have put in my first 10,000, actually already 11, thousand hours into my second career venture capital so based on that I can be um, uh, I can be described as an expert mm -hmm. <laughs> another 11,000 hours and uh, I will actually mean something in this industry um, I really yeah. I it was time to change mm -hmm. uh, throughout my financial career my clients industry my primary my primarily my clients were technology and telecommunications so I fell in love with people who either create new technology or deploy it in a fast way. Yeah. Fell in love with people who make new technology and new things. And I really found this niche of fast-growing technology companies and venture capital firms who support them and who, who make it possible. And I just one day, I just one six-month thinking period, I made the change and joined a group of people to do this and my partner and I today are the two people from that group and we have narrowed down what we do what we do to Viaduct Ventures, a Series A early stage California uh, technology venture fund. Cool. So you are now an advisor to technology companies, or, mm -hmm. or you were also during your time at EY, I believe, an advisor to, to technology companies from early stages to IPO, and you specialize in, in growth of the business, corporate governance, um, building successful, scalable startup business models. Tell us a little bit about how you do this and, and what is your criteria when looking and taking these businesses apart? A few words a little bit about the stage at which we, we invest and where we find our portfolio companies. Uh, we invest at the so-called Series A stage is the stage where the uh, usually a technology startup 
has started monthly recurring revenues, which means the technology is done, the product is done, the market distribution channels, at least one or two of them are there, and now the company is trying to actually bring this product to the market and start regular sales revenues, ac revenue activity. So we are, Series A is the first round, which is a growth money. The, the money that we, together with our co-investors, bring into the company goes primarily into distribution and growing of sales. Marketing, hiring salespeople inside the company, obtaining new sales channels, and basically kicking off the hockey stick growth of revenues that is required or understood for a California startup. So from that point, from that standpoint, it's actually um, over the past five, six years, this area, Series A, Series C, has emerged as a death valley for uh, early stage technology startups, not just California, everywhere in the world. There's lots of angel investors, friends, parents, who are able and happy to finance the company to the point where technology is done and the product is in the market. There is a lot of bubble money everywhere in the world, including in the United States, who are happy to make $100 million rounds, $300 million rounds, and I as in the case of Uber, billion dollar rounds. But it's exactly when you've already proven out your business model and the revenue is there. Mm -hmm. But it's exactly that moment, that one or one and a half years, where you're taking one-off proof of concept revenues and turning them into regular normal revenues, where you're taking your technology invention company and making it a commercial company. That's exactly the stage where the highest risk is and where professional investors are very, very careful and risk averse in terms of investing it. And that's where we come in. And so from that standpoint, uh, the two biggest needs of the startup at that point of time is selling and scaling. We cannot help with that. We can help find people who, who can help doing that. And the other largest need is prepare for the next round of venture financing. Build out the corporate governance, create the board, create the board of advisors, clean the cap table, clean up the explanation of what the company does, how it makes money, the cap table and the waterfall analysis, what the next investors in the next round will be facing when they invest in the company. And then of course, actually create the terms for the next round, bring in investors in the next round and make terms as favorable as possible to the existing shareholders. That part, corporate finance, corporate governance is what we do. We usually uh, insist that we are either members of the board or at least non-voting members of the board. Mm -hmm. So we work uh, fairly, at least once a week, so fairly regularly with every one of our portfolio companies in order to build their scale and in order to prepare for their next round of financing. So what are the biggest issues that tech startups face and how do you help them avoid these pitfalls or overcome them? Mm -hmm. Hold your mic a bit closer when you speak. Understand, this. how about this? They can hear you better now. <laughs> right, um, those are not pitfalls. The okay. venture industry is 55 years old all of the statistics have been done, all of the textbooks have been written, and all of the uh, memoirs of early starters have been published and, and so on. This is not a new industry. Everybody knows what the pitfalls are. It's all in the textbooks. The issues, call them, mm -hmm. that startups are, are, are facing, the number one issue is the point where a cool new technology or a cool new science needs to get narrowed down uh, made into a product that you can describe in a contract that you can attach a price to and sell it to a customer or a corporate customer and get them to confirm that they need this product by paying you. That is the, that is the biggest problem. The vast majority of early stage startups do not survive that stage. We do not deal with that problem. We invest only after that problem has been solved. The second bi biggest problem that, that startup face is the stage that I just described. You do have the product. You do have the first one-off revenue. You have interested clients, sometimes clients with amazing names, Google and Walmart 
and SAP and DHL are interested in our product. It's very easy to go down the round of one-off R&D of proof of concept revenues and fall in love with your clients. And then once the proof of concept uh, stage ends, you are left with no uh, future and no runway in terms of money. That is exactly the point where you need to be um, somewhat selfish or ruthless with your clients and say, clients will love you. We cannot jump to your every whim. You need to subscribe to a monthly or quarterly fee and we need to turn this into a recurring commercial business. Sometimes founders um, are too timid and just miss this point. Sometimes founders cannot negotiate this properly because the corporations have all the power. So a lot of startups fail, even though they already have one-off revenues, sometimes in the millions of dollars. What happens is because it's not recurring revenue, they're not able to raise the next round of financing. And then at one point of time, they have to either sell the business for a pittance or just completely close the doors and, and lose the uh, four, five, six years of your life for no, uh, for no return. The second problem is the one where we, where we help. If, if you describe this time of the life of the startup as the valley of death, then you could describe us as sitting at the end of the valley of death and reaching into it and pulling you out. We will not go into the valley of death with you. But the ones that are close, we will reach out and pull you out into the uh, space where there are revenues and willing financiers to provide you more and more revenue growth. So you've talked a little bit about why venture capital, um, but when do you think companies are really ready to access venture capital? And what does it all kind of mean? Well, if you look at... Keep it close. <laughs> <laughs> Very strict. Well, if you look at... It's, again, the textbooks are there. The blogs of famous venture investments are there. Revenue is by far more important than equity financing or debt financing. Mm -hmm. If your revenue is growing... Uh, on a hockey stick curve already, then venture capitalists will actually call you. Okay. So the key focus, revenue is sustainable. It's a payment that you keep. And if it's recurring revenue, it's a payment that you keep and you have a very high chance that next month this revenue will come again and next month it will come again. From that point, everybody loves that. You love it. Your early employees who are probably working for a smaller salary and the promise of future stock options love that and outside existing shareholders uh, existing investors like that and future investors like that too so demonstrate the first revenue demonstrate the first recurring revenue if you cannot do it alone then use angel investors people who you know people who are here i understand there's quite an infrastructure of individual angel investors here in Gibraltar. Mm -hmm. And once there's the first recurring revenue traction and maybe a good logo cloud, like very interesting names that are on your client list, that's the time when you go for a professional venture round. And the use of process from this round should not be more technology, should not be more programming. It should be rolling out the sales organization selling more and growing your revenue. So what are the types of startups that you would look at as the managing director of Viaduct Ventures, but you're also managing director of another, or have been, of another seed fund called Launch Gurus? Um, so so it's a family. Uh, we manage a, we are an asset management company that manages a family of funds. We, all the funds do approximately the same. Um, we are, our industry focus currently is artificial intelligence, machine learning, and IoT. Everything that has to do with massive amounts of data and artificial intelligence that helps figure out the meaning of the data and allows the customers, large US enterprises, to use it to increase their financial performance. Preferably increase their revenue streams if not, then significantly decrease their cost base. 
The reason we're focusing on artificial intelligence right now is exactly like I was saying before. Generally, the technology of artificial intelligence is done. In the lab, it works perfectly, everything is done. Now is the time to take the technology out of the lab and out of the university audience mm -hmm. and figure out ways to use it commercially for the largest enterprises of the world. And uh, once you've found a way to use it commercially, show a little bit of revenue growth and exit to those same enterprises for life-changing amounts of money. That's exactly what we do. There are other industries there. There are, of course, other geographical locations other than California out there. We're trying to stay focused and there's so much, there's such a good pipeline in artificial intelligence in California that we're just focusing on that and growing our portfolio uh, from that. So when we spoke on our initial call, you gave me some very interesting figures. And I'd like to share those because what I found interesting is the amount of startups you look at mm -hmm. and the amount of startups you end up supporting or taking through the process, how many of those have got rounds of funding um, and the successful exit. So can you just talk us through those figures? Because I thought that was super okay. interesting. Okay. Statistically in the United States, uh, one out of 10 uh, startups that obtained or raised venture financing will get to, a, to an exit. Or to be more specific, eight out of 10 will shut down and, and the investors lose the money and the founders will lose their money completely. One will grow on a slow scale and return maybe a couple of million for the founders and return maybe 1.2, 1.5x to their investors, maybe one dollar on the dollar invested. And one in 10, will grow on the hockey sticks and make a hundred, two hundred, three hundred million dollar exit and return 20x on invested capital. It is at the early stage when the company has just started scaling its revenue, it's absolutely impossible to predict which ones are going to be the winners. The story about, oh, I looked the entrepreneur in the eye <laughs> and I saw a billion dollars. That is, of course, a magical, mystical thing. That is the thing of the past. The, st the statistics are in. It just does not happen, right? So the only way to meaningfully invest in early stage startups is to invest by portfolio. We, uh, the minimum portfolio needs to be 10 companies. We'll try to deploy into 20, the first deployments into 20, 30 companies. And then we watch them as they grow and we double down and triple down in the portfolio leaders and the stars of the portfolio. And then so the, uh, to keep our proportion of shares in the growing uh, companies. So when they are exiting at $300 million, we keep our 5% share or keep our 10% share, 10% uh, in, in that startup. That's the statistics of after they've raised professional venture investment. Okay. In terms of startups that, w that are created as an idea, uh, that get to venture investment, that's probably another one in 10. Okay. So, yeah, one in 100. You know what? No, 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 take it back. One in 1,000. One in 10 will get to angel investment. Mm -hmm. Of those who have raised angel investment, one in 10 will get to venture investment. And of those who raised venture investment, one in 10 will get to a meaningful exit. So one in 1,000. Okay. So it's, yeah, lots of ideas out there, right? Lots of ideas out there. Of course, technologies are, a lot of the startup ideas are, are the same. Mm -hmm. A lot of technology are, are the same. And so the question is not about, not necessarily about who has the best, better technology. The question is rather uh, of who has better commercial execution. Mm -hmm. Even that is even that is not a given. So even that, it, the usual uh, the usual story of we're emerging on a journey mm -hmm. in the market where nobody knows, no, absolutely nobody can predict what will happen five years from now. The technology changes so fast, regulation changes so fast, client preferences change so far so fast. 
you have a very general vector of idea of how things are going to pan out. So therefore, the only way to test your ideas is to do. There's absolutely no, beyond two weeks of thinking, there's absolutely no way of thinking, planning, creating financial plans and budgets. All of that is completely out of the window, right? The only way to see if you can do something is do. And once you've arrived at the idea that the, that the only way to achieve something is do, then you immediately know when the best time to start doing is. It's right. today. It's right now. The longer you think and debate and research, the longer you are depriving yourself of the opportunity, uh, opportunity to build something new for the world. Same with us as investors. There's absolutely no way to figure out ahead of time who is the winner. So therefore, find the ones who look like winners, create a portfolio of as many as possible, work with them to bring them to $100 million exit, and maybe if we're very, very lucky, we will bring one to a $10 billion IPO and all get crazy rich. Mm -hmm. This is not, this is a gamble. This is not a manageable. We cannot manage to a billion dollar exit. You can only hope for a billion dollar exit. So you've only been in Gibraltar for a day. And mm -hmm. as you've seen, we are big advocates for tech in specific industries. But what is really happening in Silicon Valley right now? What is happening in Silicon Valley right now? Um, <laughs> Silicon Valley accounts for about a half of the global uh, venture market. It's about 120 billion a year industry, mm -hmm. which sounds like a lot. It's actually nothing around different rounding difference compared to America's GDP. However, it's quite a sizable market, mostly condensed around San Francisco and a little bit in New York. Uh, the valley of death is definitely there. There is a very vibrant and very rich market in angel investors, first generation rich people, including tech people, who are who allocate one, two million of their portfolio and write fifty thousand dollar checks to support various entrepreneurs. There is, as you read in the newspapers every day, there is a vast industry of billion dollar venture funds, small P, Bain, Goldman Sachs, all these people, out of town people, SoftBank, Russian oligarchs, name it, who are prepared to write $300 million checks. And there's precious little in between. So the early stage Series C, Series A, is right now the valley of death for technological startups in California as much as it is anywhere else in the world. The overall financial market is looking like it's going to be a little more full of turmoil, a little more risk averse in the next two years. What this will mean is that venture allocations to venture will be even smaller. So far they're growing. 2019 will be the historical year for venture investment. 2020 will probably go back. What this means is all of the large fund will want to invest in the same winners. So the large rounds, the crazy valuations, all of that is going to continue. While the Series A and the Series C companies who are just beginning their commercialization will see a significant decrease in money available to them. So what this means for entrepreneurs is get to the revenue soon. Mm -hmm. What this means for us as an investors is we, all, we will only invest and we already do that, we only invest in the ones that have recurring revenues or deep pocket investors who have pockets deep enough to carry the startups through the next couple of years, or preferably both. So tell us what of your portfolio companies that you're, that you're now um, handling with Viaduct Ventures are you most excited about and what is it that they do? Mm -hmm. Um, with your permission, because this is a public mm -hmm. meeting, I will <laughs> omit the, n the specific names. Yes, but no worries. We do have an, in our portfolio the industrial IoT company. Okay. Um, the leading 
Fortune 500 uh, industrial companies have been deploying various gadgets in their production facilities for about seven, eight years now. So everything is has a gadget and all this information gets gathered and gets put on Oracle platform. And from there, nothing is done. It, it is not being used at all, right? So every large corporation has its own data scientists and engineers trying to figure out what to do with it. Our portfolio company has a cloud-based solution that you turn on, takes the onboarding takes about one hour for the entire corporation, not per plant, but for the entire corporation. And it starts thinking and analyzing immediately. And when you come back the next morning, you already have the first recommendations. Uh, to it, mostly the use cases are increasing throughput so increasing revenue, therefore, and preventing industrial accidents. A large North American plant, any unforeseen stoppage or an accident or a small fire uh, costs the corporation about $15 million. Um, our, our startup um, bills on a, per, on a per plant per year basis an amount that is incomparably smaller than that. So industrial IoT, massive amounts of data, uh, an, an artificial intelligence instance that is able to analyze all this data and make it into measurable two, three, four percent increase in revenues and a measurable decrease in accidents and small fires. What was the other one? Uh, we have a company in our portfolio that is a, 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 an artificial intelligence based on psychology science that serves to increase employee engagement at large corporations. So white collar, young millennial workers, employee engagement, as you know, is low. And so they get, once a year, they get a 360 a questionnaire saying, does your company love you? Does your boss understand you? Right, we all know <laughs> the answers. The answer is either no or I don't want to take the survey, right? <laughs> uh, it's a major issue, especially in the United States. There is no, effectively, no uh, unemployment, so people can change jobs all the time, especially white collars. They created this instance of artificial intelligence that is also in the cloud. Mm -hmm. There is a mobile deployment on each, uh, each uh, employee's mobile phone that sends employees once every working day, sends employees normal humanly phrased questions sometimes directly about their job sometimes indirect stuff like oh it's morning it's monday morning again happy to go to work based on the answers the answer to the to the question are you happy to go back to work on monday is actually a very important statistics about the happiness of your employees the normal number is 50 50 right when 90 percent are unhappy about going to work it is clearly a problem so uh there's an ability to do multiple choices, there's an ability to write, the, the AI analyzes what they're writing, mm -hmm. and it's learning every day. The clients, are, they have pretty deep penetration in Italy, the Italians in Silicon Valley, pretty deep penetration in Italy and Britain, and now the idea is to <laughs> beef up US presence and US revenues, and uh, exit to a large data company where we're hoping and dreaming to exit to somebody like SAP or Salesforce or somebody like that. Uh, so a combination of just young people understanding what young people want, psychology, science, and artificial intelligence. Perfect. So you have machine learning, predictive analytics, tool sets, algorithms, um, solving for one company or a vertical. Um, these are some examples of using this type of breakthrough tech. Mm -hmm. um, but what is it essential when you choose to invest in the business and make them a part of Vidat Ventures portfolio? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We start with the founder. Mm -hmm. I talked about it a little bit before. Of course, we start with the founder and the person, and we want to see the fire in their eyes. But that's just the beginning. Of course, if the eyes are dead, uh, we cannot continue talking about it. Of course, a person... Uh, we, we, we really like it and it's really necessary for us to consider a person who is trying to do something radically new, something brand new with a technology that will change 
people's behaviors change the world, or at the very least, will change corporate behaviors and make corporate results that much better. Then we go through the plan of what is the product, how, is, how are you going to build the market, who, is your who your clients are, what other people you will you need to hire, how much money you will need to get all of that off the ground, and then we uh, end up right back at the founder and we say, can that person actually do all that? Um, we're not, um, there are no such thing as perfect teams. All of our founders are technical founders, engineers by profession. So the answer is, can this engineer by profession turn around tomorrow and go sell and sell $2 million worth of contract? The standard answer to that is no. What we are looking for is a technical founder, an engineer who can, who's smart enough and open enough, emotional intellig emotionally intelligent enough mm -hmm. to open up to let go of parts of managing parts of the company, yeah. bring in experienced people and actually work with them and listen to them, listen to the voice of the market, change what needs to be changed and uh, you know, stop focusing on technology only and start focusing on technology and how people perceive it and how people pay for it. If those are all given, we present it to our co-investors mm -hmm other Silicon Valley venture funds or bands of angels, angel investors. And if enough of them also see the picture the way we see it, then we'll pull the trigger, issue the term sheet, issue the investment. Perfect. So how important do you think for a small jurisdiction like Gibraltar and, and our economy to support and create a conducive environment for tech startups? It is, of course, very important. Uh, Gibraltar is a very small, uh, so really what, what uh, Gibraltar is, is a jurisdiction, favorable jurisdiction, especially for uh, FinTech. The markets are not here. The markets that you as sub startup founder should go f after are the lar should be the largest markets in the world. China, US, Germany, Britain. And, and others that are large, really large in terms of numbers of people, in terms of dollars floating in those markets. So I guess the support that the entrepreneurs in Gibraltar need is help them create the holding structures or the legal structures to get their companies off the ground and then help them find ways to sell or to scale into the large markets. Don't be greedy, let the founders go. The founders need to be close to clients, close to paying clients. Uh, the historical statistics shows that about, of, about the half of the rich exits that people achieve in America, about half of the money gets funneled back into home economy. Usually, people either go back home or they stay in America, but they start new companies and they hire engineers and support stuff in their home countries. About a half of the billions that Sky, Skype people uh, realized after their exit to Microsoft ended up back in Estonia. And that is a tremendous difference uh, that it made for a tech community in Estonia. Yeah. And that's th that's this statistic is actually holds. In terms of what, um, what Gibraltar investors can do to support, uh, prob Gibraltar probably needs a structured process mm -hmm. of finding technical entrepreneurs, maybe even attracting technical entrepreneurs from elsewhere in Europe and outside Europe, mm -hmm. giving them this one year, six to 12 to 18 months to put together the company, put together the commercial plan, plan put together the first attempts at sale, and then let them go figure out who the markets are and then push them out to those markets. Uh, it, the process could be, the process of attracting and figuring out which ones are going to be successful can be much more organized and efficient than it is today. Mm -hmm. And this is something that the private investment community of Gibraltar should do. In terms of government involvement, it is my firmly held view that governments should not invest directly into commercial companies. What the government can do, can do, of course, is a regulatory support and maybe real estate. Maybe if somebody wants to start an accelerator or an incubator here, maybe the government 
can give them a 50 year lease for one dollar something like that so a support and the pr support but do not let the government provide grants or equity investments that usually everywhere in the world usually does not end well cool so thank you so much for right sharing correct your answer <laughs> Your insights have been really amazing. It's the first time we've had anyone from Silicon Valley. So you may know Startup Grind from, from USA. Mm -hmm. But the aim is to educate, inspire, and connect. This is our 33rd consecutive event in Gibraltar. So thank you for joining us. Thank you to the sponsors, Gibraltar Finance and Abacus, Levantis and Diane Moss for supporting and making the introduction to Vadim. I'm Cham, you guys, for joining this uh, US Gibraltar Enterprise Week. The team, um, Startup Grind, my co-director, Margaret, and a new volunteer, Mark. So thank you so much also to Sunborn, which is our new venue partner. But most of all, thank you to you guys for attending. And please stay for a drink and some food. I'll be. Um, yep. I'll hang back to to answer all of your questions somewhere around that area. In conclusion, subscribe to Gary Vaynerchuk on Facebook. Uh -huh. Listen to his. I'm sorry, he's a little bit of a foul mouth, but that's okay. Listen to him and do what he says, which is figure out, spend a little time figuring out what you want to do, and then just go do. And uh, people like us are here to support you. Thank you very Thank much. You.